said yesterday more than just in the natural. Brother Ernie was a blessing to me as well. Oh, yeah, great. <clears throat> Several things he said really, really blessed me. Oh, yeah. And you sang and enjoyed it, that. It was really capturing. Amen. <laughs> and he had told me that a few days ago he had thought about calling me saying he wasn't going to be able to make it because he was in a lot of pain with his leg. But the lady went ahead and came on. Amen. Matthew, the 27th chapter and the 15th verse. I actually considered last night <clears throat> Seeing if Brother Bill would preach for us this morning, I was in so much pain with my hand and mm -hmm. kind of hard, you know, to concentrate. But poor old Brother Bill, he ain't in too good shape himself. So, mm -hmm. hallelujah! I got to think about Paul. How that, uh, you know, most of his writings were done while he was in prison, <clears throat> probably chained to a wall. <clears throat> I thought, well, if Paul can write some letters and do some preaching while he's in prison, surely I can do this this morning. And this morning's message, and you might you might, you know, say, well, Brother Billy just wasn't feeling well, so he didn't dig very deep, but this may not be the most profound message that you will ever hear. May not be the deepest. But without a doubt, for many of you out there listening by radio and watching this, for without a doubt this will be the most important one that you've ever heard. <clears throat> Because we're going to deal this morning with the most important question that you will ever ask yourself in this life. And it's not where I will invest my money. It's not where I'll decide I'm going to build my home or where I'm going to live or where I'm, what I'm going to do with my life as far as my education or my business. Because all of that stuff sooner or later will be gone. But it deals with the most important question that you will ever ask yourself. And you might find it strange... The original source of this is the man who would sentence Jesus to death because of the multitude crying for Him to be crucified. Matthew, the 27th chapter and the 15th verse, says now, and this is where we pick this up, we pick it up, this would be the last court that Jesus would be in. He would be before Pilate here His last time. It says now at the feast, the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner. Now, it was a tradition that during this time of Passover, during this time of the feast, that one prisoner could be released. If it was voted upon by the people to release him, then they would release one. And it just so happens that this day they had two prisoners. And one of them was Barabbas and the other one was Jesus. So we find Pilate here, the ruler, asking the people, which one do you want me to turn over to you? Which one would you have me to release? And it says they had a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? We have the same choice today. Maybe not called Barabbas, but certainly called the world, the flesh, or the devil, or however you want to put it. There's a choice in all of our lives, that the decision that we make regarding that choice, you see, some choices are just temporal. Some of them don't amount to much. You might decide this morning you're going to wear a red tie. A few minutes later, you decided you were going to wear a white tie. But there are choices that you make in this life that are just temporal. They don't last very long. But this choice right here, once you have made your final choice on this subject in this life, and you leave this life and go to the next, that will affect your entire eternity. There will be no turning back. There will be no, well, I've decided differently once you gave up the ghost. Your decision has been sealed and your fate has been sealed along with it. So Pilate says, which one would you choose today? Would you choose Barabbas or would you choose Jesus? And the people, the Bible says, that Pilate knew that the people had delivered Jesus to him because of their envy, because of their jealousy or because of their hatred. In other words, he knew that this man had not done anything but simply rubbed the people the wrong way long enough that they turned him over to them and want him dead. And when he had sat down in the judgment seat, the Bible says, while he's sitting here waiting for the answer of the people, his wife sends word to him and says, Pilate, 
Don't do nothing to this Jesus because I've been troubled all night long with dreams concerning this man. Mm -hmm. Don't sentence him to death. So God uses dreams to get to Pilate's wife and Pilate's wife sends word to him and says, don't do it. I'm telling you, don't do it. Don't do what the people want. Yet Pilate ignores all of that. He ignores the warning from God. He ignores the unction of the Holy Spirit. And he leans upon the will of the people. Listen, if you determine what you do on people, you're in trouble. If the choices that you make in life or in ministry or has to do with your church deals upon the popularity of the people, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. We find Pilate here, if the Bible says that his, in verse 19, it says, when he sat down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with this just man? Did you hear that? Mm -hmm. For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. Now Pilate's wife, she's convinced that Jesus is a just man. She sins and warns her husband, don't do this, honey. But the chief priest and the elders, all religion always got to get involved, amen. But the chief priest and the elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask for Barabbas to be released and to destroy Jesus. Religion. These people who knew the law and the Torah better than anybody. This is how I know salvation can't be found in the Torah, amen. These people knew the law down every jot and every tittle. They knew all about what Moses had said. They knew all about what the Ten Commandments had said. They knew all about the Jewish rituals and the Jewish laws and the feasts. But they were lost as a ball in high weeds because they didn't understand that all of that stuff pointed to this just man that was standing before Pilate. So they convinced the multitude to cry out, don't cry out for them to release Jesus, but cry out for them to release Barabbas. And it says, The governor answered and said unto them, Whither of the twain, which of the two, will you have that I release? And they said, Barabbas. And see, we have the same choice today. In this life, when you get to the end, just before you're getting ready to leave this life and go into the next, none of the wealth that you have attained matters. None of the material things in this life that you have gained matters. All of the decisions you made concerning your finances doesn't matter. All of the decisions that you made concerning your company, your business, or whatever your affairs were in this life does not matter. What matters is what did you do with this Jesus that stood before you? Did you condemn Him as the crowd did and as Pilate did? Did you lock Him out or did you open the door and let Him in? Did you judge Him faithful or did you judge Him a fake? Your decision that you made concerning Jesus in this life will be the only thing that determines your eternity. Did you judge him to be, well, he was a good man, he was a prophet, yeah. But did you judge him to be the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world? And that's the choice that was facing the people that day. Do we choose Barabbas? Do we choose Jesus? And they were persuaded by religion not to choose Jesus. And we have to say, oh, Brother Billy, surely not. Oh, yeah. Today we still have religion persuading people not to choose the way of the Bible, not to choose the way of Jesus, but to choose the way of, of tradition and religion or the ways of the world or the ways of man, which the Bible says there is a way that seemeth right unto a man. He's talking about religiously. It seems right to a man, but the end thereof is destruction and death. So the people stand there with this Jesus standing before Pilate, and Pilate has a decision to make. And the people have a decision to make. The people's decision was formed, was uh, influenced by the religious leaders. Pilate's decision was influenced, he was persuaded by the will of the people. So he chooses against Jesus because of the will of the people. The people choose against Jesus because of the religious crowd and the persuasion that they received, the Bible says from the chief priests and the elders, and they all make the wrong choice as far as them. Now we know Jesus was sent to die. He was going to die. He was going to go to the cross, but I wouldn't want to be the one to drive the nails. Amen? And these people were faced with a decision. And just as all the Bible is from Genesis to Revelation, you can see pictures and types and examples of things in our lives and others' lives 
And we see here Pilate deciding what to do with Jesus. We see here the people deciding what will they do with Jesus. And you today have the same decision to make in your life. What will you do with this Jesus? And Pilate said unto them, and here's the question of the ages. This is the most important thing. And listen, this is coming from the lips of a man who later on would commit suicide. I don't know if it had anything to do with what he did this day or not, but I, he was a man and I'd almost guarantee you it haunted him. Amen. I know we've seen movies and things where they, they had Herod in them and I don't remember which one it was, but one of the movies had where here where we're reading a moment where he washed the blood off of his hands, you know, symbolically. And one of the movies showed Herod later on after the crucifixion, after he had put Jesus to death, it showed him having dreams and of blood being on his hands and waking up in a cold sweat. And I don't know whether there's any reality to that or not, but it certainly is possible. When you stand there knowing that this just man, he says, I find no fault in this man. His wife sends him warning that she's been warned that this is a just man and don't do this. But he goes ahead and does it for the will of the people and then later on he commits suicide. It leads you to think, you know, something was tormenting the man. Something was not right in his mind and in his life. And it very well may have been the decision that he made this day sealed his fate for eternity. And he said to the people, and this is the question. This is the title of our sermon this morning. This is what I want us to get from, from what this man said. He said, what shall I do then with Jesus which is called Christ? Oh, you're talking about a powerful statement today. You're talking about a question that every one of us in this life, sooner or later, will have to ask ourselves. What will, what will I do with this Jesus which is called the Christ? What will I do? Will I accept Him or will I reject Him? Because that's what it comes down to. Will I open the door and let Him into my heart? Will I allow Him to be Lord of my life? Or will I just allow Him to be a, you know, some a casual acquaintance of my life? Will I allow Him to move in and take over my heart? Or will I just build Him a little room and just keep Him in there for nobody else to see? Will I allow Jesus to be Jesus in me? Will I accept Him to be the Lamb of God and the Savior that He is? Or will I just shrug Him off and say, well, He was a prophet and no more. What shall I do with Jesus which is called Christ. And every one of us at one point or another in this life will have to answer this question. You can't plead the fifth. You can't say, well, I refuse to answer that because you have to answer that. Your eternity depends upon you answering the question, what will I do with Jesus? Will I allow Him? Will I put my faith in Him? Or will I turn Him away? And that decision that you make will determine your eternity and where you spend that eternity. Heaven or hell. It's still heaven or hell today. Amen. There is no purgatory. I talked to someone one time and they said, well, you know, surely there's a place for people who not, you know, they don't know Jesus. They haven't accepted Him, but they're just not that bad of people. I said, no, unfortunately, there's a heaven. There is a hell. There is no in-between. There is no place for people who, even though they were good people, they rejected Jesus if you do that, that shuts the gates of heaven and opens the gates of hell because there's only one way to get to heaven. I know that's considered narrow-minded. I know that's considered dogmatic. I know that's not considered popular in the day that we live, but it's the truth anyway. Amen. Jesus is still the only way. And here we find this way, standing before Pilate as if it's a crossroads, Barabbas or Jesus. Barabbas or Jesus. And not just before Pilate, but before the people. Listen what these people would say. When Pilate saw that he could prevail, hold it back up here. And the governor said, Why, what evil hath he done? Now he's talking about Jesus, 23rd verse, 27th chapter. But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. Verse 24, Pilate said, The Bible says that Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but rather a turmoil was made. They really begin to throw a fit whenever he tried his best. Listen, I don't know why you want this man dead. But the Bible says then he calls for a basin of water. 
And he took the water and he washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. Mm -hmm. See ye to it. And you know what these people said? What their response was? They answered all the people, these people who had been convinced by religion that they were right. There will be a lot of people in hell that were convinced by religion that they were right. Mm -hmm. Instead of going to the source and finding out for themselves, the people answered Brother Rodney and they said, His blood be on us and on our children. In other words, if He is innocent, let the judgment be upon us and upon our children. These were Jewish people. Now, I don't know if this has anything to do with it or not, and I'll just throw this in here and it may, I may be way out in left field. But the Jews have suffered many things. Mm -hmm. Amen? Yeah. They have suffered many things. They still suffer today the turmoil of their enemies and trying to take away their land. Yeah. I don't know this, but I know the Bible says you reap what you sow. And when these people said, oh, let the judgment come on us. Let His blood rest upon us and upon our children. Mm -hmm. I don't know that that doesn't have something to do with the fact that they've had it so rough. Amen? Yeah. Because you reap what you sow. And Pilate says, well, what would you have me do with this Jesus that is called Christ? What do you want me to do with Him? What am I to do with Him? See, Pilate, was, it wasn't just the people that made a decision that day. It was Pilate. He had every authority, every bit. He could, it wouldn't make him popular. It's like the political leaders we have today, you know. It wouldn't make him popular if he stood for something that the people didn't want. But he certainly could have said... This man may be put to death, but it ain't going to be under my watch. And turned him loose. But he didn't do that. He decided to allow the will of the people to, to uh, persuade him to allow Jesus to be crucified. And the people were persuaded by religion. And you today are persuaded by things. Whether to accept Jesus or whether you've heard the gospel, you've been given the book, God is trying His best to persuade you to accept Jesus, yet so many, many, many more have rejected Him than that have accepted Him. Because they've been persuaded in one direction or the other. Every one of us, your life will come down to what you chose to do with Jesus. We find the two male factors hanging beside of Jesus, one on one side, one on the other, and in Luke, the 23rd chapter, these two men, now, all of the choices that they made in life, some of the choices that they made got them where they were at, hanging on the cross. But all of the choices that they made in life would not be the choices that decided their eternity. It would be this one. As they hung beside Jesus of Nazareth, it would be this last choice that they would be confronted with that would decide their eternity. Not that the other ones didn't amount to something in this life, but in the next life, this would be the most important one that they would make. And the Bible says that one of the male factors looks at Jesus, rails upon him, mocks him, and he says, you can save yourself, save yourself. And the other one says, what are you doing? This man hasn't done anything. And he sees this Jesus and turns to him and says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus turns to him and says, today you will be with me in paradise. These two men are faced with a choice. To choose to accept Jesus or choose to reject Jesus. You, if you haven't been faced with this choice, and many times people will be given more than one chance, but I wouldn't count on the next one. I wouldn't count on sitting under the convicting power of the Holy Spirit and saying, well, I'll get another chance to choose Jesus. I'll get another opportunity to go to the altar. I'll get another opportunity to live for Him because today may be your last opportunity to make this decision the decision that will shape the rest of your your life and eternity more important it will shape and it will decide your eternity where you whether you go to heaven or whether you go to hell we find another man a rich young ruler the bible says in matthew the 19th chapter that comes to jesus and he had great wealth and he comes to Jesus and he says, Good Master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And Jesus talks to him about the commandments. He talks to him about the different things. And the man says, You know, I've lived a good life. I've kept the commandments. 
But Jesus knew he was wealthy. Had a lot of money. And Jesus turns to him, Brother Sleece, and he says, well, go and sell everything you got. And then take up your cross and follow me. And the Bible says that this young man who stands here with the choice to either choose his money, his wealth, and his status in the community, his status in the world, the position that he holds, whether to choose Jesus or whether to choose his money. And you know what he does? The Bible says when confronted with this choice, that this young man went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Didn't want to sell them. Didn't want to get rid of them. Listen, there ain't nothing wrong with having things, but when those things have you, you've got a problem. And that's exactly what was wrong with this man. It wasn't that he had great possessions. It was that great possessions had him. He couldn't bear his, he couldn't find himself a way or, 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 or the decision to be able to say, well, I don't want those things as much as I want Jesus. Sooner or later, you'll have to make that choice. Whether you want more of this world or whether you want more of Jesus. Whether you want the things of the world or whether you want the things of God. And this young man, the Bible says, goes away sorrowful because he makes the decision that will more than likely decide his eternity because the Bible never talks about this man again. It never says anything about him getting right. If I, if I had to guess this morning, I would say that he went to hell because of the decision that he made right here, right at this moment in time. And every one of us today have either made the decision to accept Jesus or we've made the decision to reject Jesus. You might say, well, I haven't rejected Him. I just decided to do it later. No, in doing that, you rejected Him. You decided you would do it later and rolled the dice and decided, well, I'm going to see if I have another tomorrow. Because you don't know if you have another tomorrow. None of us know whether we'll have another tomorrow or not. So in this this morning, we see that Pilate allows peer pressure, the desire of the crowd to influence his decision. But when Pilate stands before God, the crowd won't stand there with him. He won't be able to turn and say, well, they made me do it. Brother Sleece, it'll be Pilate saying, I chose that. I, I will, he will stand there without excuse. It will be Pilate that stands there that day and realizes that when he said, what shall I do with Jesus, which is called Christ, he made the wrong decision. The male factor that allowed his unbelief and his skepticism to keep him from making the same choice the other one did. He will stand before God alone and say, I chose to do the wrong thing with this Christ. This rich young ruler, when he stands there before God, before the judgment seat, he will be no more wealthy than the poorest man that ever lived on planet earth because his riches will matter nothing. Yet he will stand there and realize when he asked himself, what shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? He will realize he made the wrong decision. And he'll wind up in hell because of it. All of the decisions that we make in this life, none of them are as important as this one. Oh, you can know all the mysteries. <clears throat> we can come in here this morning and you can quote to me Genesis to Revelations. You can talk to me about the law and you can talk to me about all the creations and you can talk to me about life before Adam and Eve and all of the deep things that people think they know. And you can know it all, but if you miss this one thing, all the rest of it's in vain. Matter of fact, all the rest of it may torture you even the more when you come to the end of your way and you realize, I knew all that. But I missed the most important thing out of all. I knew the Scripture, but I didn't know the one who the Scriptures testified about. Mm -hmm. When confronted with the choice, what am I going to do with Jesus? I made the wrong choice. And there is no going back and fixing this once you're dead. The good news is if you're alive today, you still have a chance to make it right. No amount of wealth, no amount of power, no amount of popularity, no amount of friends is worth it. Missing heaven and making hell your eternal home. But you don't understand, it's not popular to live for Jesus in the world that we live in. Oh, I understand that. Jesus ain't popular in the church today, in the church today. The modern church today doesn't accept him for who he really is. 
And I know this hasn't been very enlightening to many. And I don't know why I didn't get something else other than to say that somebody somewhere listening to this today, whether you're listening over radio or the internet or CD or cassette, somebody still has this choice to make. And I hope that something that we say or something that we read from the Word of God will influence the decision that you make. Because this one is the most important decision you will ever make. Oh, well, the most important decision I ever made was I invested my money into Dow Jones, whatever. I, no, 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 no. The most important thing that you will ever decide is what are you going to do with Jesus? Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Somebody else have something this morning?